Hello, I welcome you to an e-lecture of a series of e-lectures about constituent analysis. As you know, native speakers intuitively recognize that the words within sentences are structured into successively larger syntactic groups, so-called constituents. Let us illustrate that using a standard sentence. In this boy will speak very slowly to that girl, a sentence from Andrew Radford's 1977 book Transformational Syntax, we will probably all agree that very goes with slowly and not with speak. We will furthermore agree that this and boy go together and similarly that and girl. And we will also share the opinion that two and that girl somehow build another constituent. And eventually we will intuitively understand that speak very slowly, speak and very slowly belong together. And at a later stage we will group speak very slowly and to that girl into another constituent and eventually we will come up with this sort of hierarchical structure which then displays the entire sentence. So, this is the sort of constituent analysis, but why do we need to know about such constituents in the first place? Why are they interesting? And secondly, well, that's the second question, how do we arrive at such decisions? The answers to these two essential questions in syntax constitute the focus of this e-lecture. Let's start with question one. Why do we bother about syntactic units larger than words? Well, take the sentence, John saw old men and women. This construction can be interpreted in two ways. Either John saw old men and women of any age, or John saw both men and women who are old. This difference can well be represented by means of a hierarchical representation where specific constituents can be worked out. In the first case, where just the men are old, we will probably build an independent constituent that links old with men. And this can be conjoined with and and women at a later stage. In the second case, where everyone is old, well, we have men and women that build somehow a constituent and at a later stage they are conjoined with old. So cases like these, which are referred to as cases of structural ambiguity, can most adequately be represented by means of a constituent analysis. But how do we arrive at such constituents? Well, there are several interacting arguments, so-called tests, that lend support to the postulation of constituents. These arguments can be subdivided into non-syntactic arguments or tests, which come primarily from morphology and semantics, distributional tests or distributional arguments, that is, arguments con that consider the distribution of constituents within sentences, and other arguments that apply specific syntactic operations to the constituents in question. Let's take a closer look and start with the non-syntactic arguments. In many languages, Morphological considerations provide support in favor of constituents. The assumption is simple. Particular morphological features such as number, gender or case are not exclusively properties of words, but of phrases. So we have this sort of relationship. In present day English, an almost analytic language, this is often only visible in terms of number, whereas in German, number, gender and case have to be shared within phrases. 
Or take languages such as Chinese. This is an interesting case. In Chinese, the noun determines the choice of its classifier depending on its semantic potential. So, for example, book is combined with the classifier bun, whereas ball is combined with the classifier g. And both are equivalent to present-day English piece of. So, the argument here is simple. It's not just words, but larger constituents that are associated with particular morphological or semantic features. Yet, the most important arguments in favor of constituents are syntactic. In fact, many of these syntactic arguments relate to the distribution of various sequences of words. That is, to the question whether a particular sequence of words has the same distribution as another phrase of the same type. Three types of distributional tests can be distinguished. The preposing test, that is, we move items to the front and test whether the result is grammatical. The postposing test, we move items to the back and test whether the results are grammatical. And the sentence fragment test, where we isolate parts of sentences and test whether they can stand alone. In summary, distributional evidence suggests that whole constituents and not just parts of constituents are in the focus of these processes. So let's look at preposing first. Preposing means that under certain stylistic conditions, for example, to achieve a particular stylistic effect, parts of a sentence may be moved to the front. However, only a whole constituent can be preposed in this way, not just part of it. Here is an example. I don't like your new neighbor. Let's now prepose several items. For example, your new neighbor, and this clearly works. Your new neighbor I don't like. If we prepose new neighbor, well, then the result clearly is ungrammatical. Your new doesn't work and neither does just your. So in other words, since only your new neighbor works, we have reasons to believe that it is a constituent, so it is only the entire constituent, your new neighbor, that can be preposed and not just parts of it. Similarly, we can move elements to the back, again, to achieve specific stylistic effects, but again, only a whole constituent can be postposed in this way. Let's demonstrate that. He explained his problems to her. And let's find out what we can postpose. For example, we can postpose his problems. He explained to her his problems. But we cannot postpose just problems, neither can we just postpose his. So these latter two cases are ungrammatical. And again, it is only the entire construction, his problems, that can be postposed, not just part of it. Another distributional test has become known as the sentence fragment test. In a large number of contexts, especially in conversations, short-form replies are made. These replies, which are also referred to as sentence fragments, are highly constrained. Not surprisingly, only whole constituents can serve as sentence fragments. So imagine the following question, why don't you, who don't you like? Well, the answer could easily be your new neighbor. But you wouldn't use new neighbor as an answer, that's ungrammatical. Or take this one, what did he explain to her? Well, of course, his problems. That's legitimate, but if you just use his as an answer, well, that's ungrammatical. So again, it's the entire constituent that has to be used as a sentence fragment. Still, there are other types of syntactic evidence that support the claim that sentences are structured out of constituents. For example, the coordination test which tests constituent identity 
or the proform test that tests on the basis of a replacement test that replaces constituents by appropriate proforms or the ellipsis test which tests the possibility of dropping or omitting constituents. Let us look at coordination first. Present-day English, like many other languages, has a variety of coordinating conjunctions and, but, or, well, we could also use things like however and so on. They are used to coordinate to conjoin words or phrases. Interestingly, we cannot conjoin any randomly selected elements but only categories of the same type. So X and Y is impossible but X and X would be possible. Let's exemplify this. John wrote to Mary is one of our examples which I'm going to use to exemplify this and John wrote a postcard. Now obviously we have two constituents. We can easily show that they are constituents. To Mar Mary, John wrote a postcard. John wrote both can be preposed, for example. But if we conjoin them, John wrote to Mary and a postcard, the sentence becomes ungrammatical. So here we have a nice diagnostic test for the status, that is, the position in the hierarchy of constituents. Obviously, to Mary and a postcard are constituents, but they're different ones. Let's illustrate that further. Here are two constructions starting with in. John punched Bill in the face and John punched Bill in the park. The fact that John punched Bill in the face and in the park is ungrammatical tells us that in the park and in the face must have a different status. That is, they are different within the hierarchy of a sentence. They are constituents, but they are different. Another test for constituents is the proform test. Proforms are elements that refer to other items. The most commonly known elements in this respect are pronouns. As we will see in a second, they do not just stand for nouns, but for larger structures, so-called noun phrases. Here is an example. John punched his friend in the park. Let's now apply the proform test. Here are the pronouns. John can be replaced by he and his friend can be replaced by him. So they're both constituents. Or take in the park. In the park can be replaced by there. So in the park is a constituent. In fact, we call it a pro prepositional phrase form. There is a pro prepositional phrase form and in the park is a prepositional phrase. And what happens if we ask a question such as, did John punch his friend in the park? Well, the answer could be something like, yes, he did. In which case, did would stand for the entire predicate, referred to as pro-verb phrase. So proforms are important substitutes for constituents. Let us finally look at ellipsis. Under certain discourse conditions, it is possible in English and in many other languages for some part of the sentence to undergo ellipses, that is, to be omitted, provided that the omitted part can be recovered from the context. Here is an example. John won't solve his problems. Well, and like in all the other tests, it is the entire constituent solve his problems that has to be omitted, not just I bet he will solve just the, his problems, the last part. So ellipsis is something that predominantly applies to predicates. Now that we understand how we can find out whether one or several words can be grouped into constituents and that we have understood that sentences have a hierarchical structure, we can apply these criteria. However, Often, not all of these criteria apply. For example, if a string of words is already at the end of a sentence, he sat in the park, how can we postpose it? Or take the item the in the park. 
Here, morphological criteria do not apply since V is neutral with regard to number. The park or the parks. No difference. Nevertheless, there are always some criteria that can nicely help to define the status of constituents. Try these two sentences. The dog barked in the park and he took up the phone. Are the strings starting with in in the first case or the colored strings and up the phone, are they constituents or not? Just take your time and pause the video. The solution will come up in a few seconds. Okay, and here is the solution. Since the coordination test, the first test, in the park and up the phone, results in an ungrammatical construction, the two strings, in the park and up the phone, must be different. They must have a different status. And since the remaining tests, ellipsis, proform and preposing, only work for in the park, as in the dog barked, the dog barked there, or in the park, the dog barked, since this is the case, in the park is a constituent, but up the phone in the sentence he took up the phone is not. Let's summarize. Now, that we understand the mechanism of constituent identification, we have to perform the next step and find out the types of constituents that are part of today's theoretical grammar. Perhaps you already know that there are noun phrases, verb phrases, prepositional phrases and even tense phrases. So whenever we postulate such constituents and even intermediate constituents such as n bar or verb bar, have you heard about them? Well, whenever we do that, we will come back to one or several of the tests we discussed in this e-lecture. So make sure you not only remember these tests, but more importantly, that you always know how to apply them. So, see you again in one of my e-lectures about constituent analysis. Thanks a lot for listening and bye-bye.